I'd like to preface that. I've had a lot of ex exhibitions. I've stood in front of a classroom a, a lot and spoke a lot. This is my first you, you monograph. You can hold it. And you are my first book presentation and signing. And so I was a nervous wreck all day and I, and I thank you for coming. Hey. I know a lot of you here who, who from my, my life, oh, a lot of, this. there's a lot of people I know in this audience. I have a lot of friends, colleagues, and, and beloved family. But if you could just, a little show here, and I'd like to know my audience a little bit. Does any, who here lives in or comes from Bushwick? Okay, okay. who has worked there? Anyone identify in this room as a artist or photographer? And how about any teachers and writers? Okay, and and I, you probably and you're all creative people. Any anyone from out of New York? Oh, where are you visiting from? Oh, I mean, I live right now. From where? Uh, oh. Okay, well, n nice to meet you. Thank you. So I'm going to be taking you through. Ah, oh, this is a little odd because odd, I can't see you and I want to look at you. I'm going to be taking you through a little preview of some of the images in, in the work, in the book. Instead of saying the specific dates, the disco work was... I, ca I came to New York in the mid-70s, having grown up in suburbia in Long Island and, and arriving in New York City to live in my cousin's house. And I was just so thrilled to be in a vibrant, diverse city. And so I carried my medium format camera with me everywhere. And that included when the disco scene broke out in, in June, in, in 19, when it really got really hot in 1979, I went with a friend named Judith and we went, started going to, to Studio 54 in June 79 and it really went out probably every night for like at least two years. And this is the first time I've ever shown this work getting it together for the book, so I'm going to show you through. But the, 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 some of the discos, even though I wrote notes in here, I may not know the exact name of the club, but it's in the book, so if I don't know it exactly, just know the discos are generally, the disco work is generally from 77 to 79, and the Bushwick work starts in, 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 in 1982. I started in 1981, but started in eight, they're in the 80s. So just a general date. Okay. So welcome. I'll take the mic off. Let me work the mic. Okay. How's that? I like it. All right. So this is the cover of the book. The designer, Patricia O'Brien, is in the room. She even taught in Bushwick for seven years at IS-111 and, and made it through. I'll talk about this image later. So a little bit about my background as a photographer. It runs, it's in my genes. This is my grandfather, Murray Meisler. It is says he built his own tintype camera and photographed the, the streets of the South Bronx. I never, I always saw my father, my grandfather with a camera, with a light meter to my face, taking pictures. I maybe ever saw one of his pictures when they tell, and no one knows where his negatives are. And so when, when you hear the stories about Vivian Meyer, I certainly relate to it very well. Okay? It's like you could, but I learned that the act of photography is almost like breathing. It's something you do. The next great photographer in my life is my dad. My dad, Jack Meiser, great photographer. He photographed himself, his, you know, his engagement to my mom, their, their pre-wedding pictures, their dating, his self-portraits in the, in the Coast Guard, our family. He was a great photographer. And he's also a printer. He had his own printing company here in Chelsea. And to have it in a physical book form is so meaningful to me because I'm a printer's daughter. When, as a, in, in college, when I became an art education major and I went to the Museum of Modern Art and saw the Arbus show, I was very moved. It was, 
it was a moving experience that I remember. So she is certainly a great influence on my work and life. And also as a Jew, you know, the Jewish giant. I mean, I have a strong Jewish identity and it's, it comes through in my lens, of one of my, my many lenses of who I am. If you're not familiar with the work of Jacques Henry, Henri Lartigue, forgive my horrible French, he's a photographer who wasn't discovered until, oh, the age of 1960, age of 69, when he had his first MoMA exhibition of his photographs. I'll take 69 at MoMA, that'd be fine. <laughs> and, but as a child growing up in Arist an aristocratic family in, in France, he photographed his family and his friends just doing wonderful things together. And I, th when I saw his work, it's like, that's what photography is to me. I started photographing in graduate school. I took my first photography class, and I would photograph. This is my family. I grew up in Massapequa, Long Island. Matsapequa, Pequa. There are a few people from Massapequa in this room. Raise your hand. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> and a self-portrait in my bedroom growing up. Photography is how I see a lot of the world. You know, looking through the lens and seeing this is my autobiography. I, I am someone who has collected every ID card I've ever received since I'm like six years old. So I must have an issue with identity. Fast forward to the club scene. I'm a, I'm with a, I have a friend, Judith DeLong, who I met at Mardi Gras. We, are, we, hit, we hit the clubs. Once we decided we're going to the clubs, we hit the clubs and got, first got on the, the guest list to the PR agency and then it was like the doorman know us, it's like we're in. And so it was never an issue. And that's at a white party at La Clique. Here we go, this is a, a club at, it was a, these are, it was a club, a club called, it was a party group, La Clique, that were at di different clubs. And if I tell you that there were live sex acts, there were live sex acts. I wasn't ready to show that yet. Next book, maybe? Fast forward, you know, not too fast. We talk about June 77, I'm starting to go out every night. My cousin went away to, to Puerto Rico. I was like just dancing every night. And then in, in July, there was a blackout. Well, it wasn't a blackout to me. It was a night that we were supposed to go down to um, a private party at Studio 54. There was two owners at Studio 54. Steve Rebell, who was a face, and the silent business part, more silent business part that Eden Schrager had, I guess was wanting to date Judith and invite her to come to a party, part, a private party. He said, well, can Meryl come along? So I was coming along and that was, that was the night we were going to finally get into the basement, into the private rooms. And we go get all, all dressed up, all dolled up to go and what the hell's going on? It's dark. Go to the subways, no subway. You can't see the bus. We took our bikes, drove down the bicycles, down to Studio 54. It's like 59th Street, like there's like flashing headlights going on everywhere. Like, what's going on? And get to Studio 54, banging on the door. Nothing's happening, nothing's happening. And finally gave up. And I had experience growing up in Long Island, the blackhead of 64, so I did remember that. We had no idea how vast it was. And we came back and gave up, and she was really pissed at him for standing us up, not answering the telephone. And the next day, the headlines came out. You know, that it was a, this huge blackout. I actually went around photographing the streets. And the headlines talked about this neighborhood in Brooklyn that I'd never heard of, Bushwick. Who the hell had heard of Bushwick? I won't curse again, I'm sorry. Who ever heard of Bushwick? Not I. My family was from the Bronx. And it certainly wasn't a place that I'd never even thought about or would never think about again. And a few days, days later, the party was back on. The lights were back on, the parties were back on. And this is, uh, this is just like a, two weeks after the blackout. This is a, a club called Infinity. Oh, I didn't ask, did anyone, did anyone here go to the discos back in the 70s? Ah, Nadine, no wonder we're friends, okay. <laughs> So, flash forward, I'm a teacher. I needed a steady job. I was a, a freelance illustrator. 
the checks were always in the mail. I needed to pay my bills. The checks were in the mail. So in, in September 79, I started, I made use of my teaching license and I started teaching part-time in a program to, lear, to learn truth, to read through arts where I met Nadine. And it was a four day a week job. And in the summer we got no pay and we had no health care, we had no benefits. So I put my name in, you know, I was on a waiting list for a full-time job and I get a, a letter and I read the fine print on the back, show up at Intermediate School 291 on December 21st, 1981, and you can either accept a position or go back to the bottom of the waiting list. It's like, I wasn't going back. So I arrive in Bushwick, and it is, I get out of the subway, and it is a, a scene out of like Dresden, or at that time it was Beirut, you know, just look like the war happened yesterday. And it, you go up the block and it was like just building after building after close up building. And I literally, in my mind, thought it's the first, it's a, late, a few days before Christmas, maybe the, the art teacher was killed. How did, <laughs> <laughs> that's it. And, and this is a, like a view from the, the classroom window. Two of my colleagues, this, Linda Napolito is in the room, is in the room next to me, and she came to help me. She had to help me because if she, she didn't keep my, help me learn how to keep my class quiet, she could never teach. <laughs> you know, so, and teachers are really fantastic there and helped each other and were very driven and full of energy. But I, I, I didn't photograph right away because in my previous job at the last day of school I brought in my medium format camera and an intruder came in and looked at me and said, I have a, a gun, give me your, your camera. So I gave him my camera. So I was really, you know, a little edgy about that. I'd also give it, a, even though I got the same as that camera, that one was my best friend, had been everywhere. It wasn't the same. I couldn't just replace, replace it with a clone. But I started noticing going back and forth from the subway you know that people are just like living their lives and being kids and having fun and I what a, one of the first point and shoot cameras and decided I wanted to photograph what I saw just walking back and forth on the subway how does some, somebody asked me, I think it was Jane, how did, did I picture this as a book? I have been obsessively trying to, I am a little obsessive, trying to get a book of the Bushwick work because I realized it's important. And I always knew that disco was how I heard about Bushwick and I talked about it in interviews. But it clicked when this club called Bazaar in Bushwick invited me to have an exhibit and I went there because they were putting a gallery in the bottom and I look up and there's a disco ball and I literally saw the light and I said this is the body of the work that belongs together didn't have uh, like on the spot I said that's it and I said I told him about it and he said oh I'd love to see them I said well I have to find them I've never sh never ever shown the work but I know it's great work and to my shock and his shock and then it happened very quickly we decided you know he gave the offer. December we had a talk, you know, have a show. And then in February, we get together and he said, we'd like to, like to publish a book. I said, you mean like Cadillac? He said, no, a book. It's like, and we talk about this past February 16th. So we got together a book really fast. It was record fast, Patricia designed the book. And to my shock, at the, people are really into disco as well as Bushwick. So, yeah, well, once you were in the clubs, once you got past the velvet rope, you were equal with everybody else. You know, I had no trouble saying, hi Andy, how you doing, can I take your picture? And he's very shy, but are you really, I, I didn't, I'm, I'm the same as everybody else. And, and here I am with my little camera, looking out at Bushwick High School, for those of you in the a neighborhood. I'd like to know that I keep on pouring, and John Napolillo, raise your hand, is responsible, come on Johnny, he is responsible for me bringing out this body of work, because in 2007, he was, he was still teaching at Bushwick, I was teaching in Manhattan, and a colleague of his kept on egg edging him, tell me the stories about Bushwick when it was like this, and he wanted to apply for a grant to do a show at the Brooklyn Historical Society and was looking for pictures of Bushwick and couldn't find any beyond like the really typical ones you saw of the blackout. And John said, 
contact Meisler. She was always taking pictures. And so I, Adam contacted me. We did a show in, in 2007 at the Brooklyn Historical Society. And so I said, I said, I know, I have all these boxes marked Bushwick. I'll just look through them. After the show was over, I realized it didn't matter that these were blurry little pictures. Some would mold on them and dust, take them to point and shoot. I knew they were gorgeous images. And so I became obsessed. But it wasn't until two years later when I looked through the pictures again that I literally found myself. I never saw that, that this was me. And it's marked October 24th. It was my birthday. Ah, uh, the opening night of La Fafale, the butterfly. That is Miss Grace Jones. But the same elegance is in Ovette O'Dell on graduation day. So pairing them up to, made all sense. When they first, the book first came back a copy from the printer, they made a mistake and they printed, they didn't print, the, when you look at the book, it's the disco on the left and the bushwick on the right, and it was printed in the wrong order, and it totally changed it. So that's where I realized the concept worked, that it really changed the meaning of everything. Here is really a week after the blackout. This is Shirley, this is Shirley McLean with Bella Abzug on her 57th birthday. It shocks me when the show that I have now in, up in Bushwick that some people don't know who Bella Abzug is. When at first she ran for, what, she ran for governor? Or mayor? Mayor? Mayor. I mean, and I can't believe she's 57 because she seemed like such an old lady at the time. And this is Steve Rubell. When the face, the face owner of uh, Studio 54, and I'm sure that room is filled with movers and shakers. Most shocking is when I look through the pictures, I find a picture of my cousin Elaine's father and his wife hanging out of Studio 54 that night. I laugh. <laughs> <laughs> and politics in Bushwick. Miranda is running for senator. And it, 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 like, how did that hole come into be on the side of a building? There were not bombs, but didn't understand how did it come to be? These are these aren't people who look like the village people. These are the village people. They were stepping out of uh, b b b b the, the ballroom, the something ballroom, I forgot, the ballroom, and they were going to the, perform at the opening night of Xenon. Wild club names, and that was one wild club, let me tell you. Love this, you know, the three amigos, you know, I would take pictures going to and from work. At the show, my, and, the, and I wasn't until I blew it up. I mean, I knew what was going on, but yeah, that is a little nickel bag there. And in the show that I have up right now at the gallery, a dude from the neighborhood comes in, and he's on a cane, he's this and that, and he's like, this guy, he lives right here. This one's in prison, that one's dead. And so I'm gonna get that to meet them, because that's my next mission, in case you ask. I'm going to find every, I'm going to find them. I'm going to seek them out and find out who they are and what they're doing now. And I've gone back to the street corner. It's kind of wild to find, to find the street corner. This is a, a little mouche, and this, and then this guy with his, there was a real glitter and glam on those fingers, and I asked, you know, who are you? And he goes, I'm, I'm Liberace's protege. <laughs> I think someone's been in, you know, you hear about someone named Scott Thornson, who is Liberace's lover, who he, as a young man, Liberace um, had him, the young man gets plastic surgery to look like Liberace. This, this gentleman would be, be a little too old to be Scott, I believe. But who knows? He, maybe this is a clone. But then he'd walk down the block and really the beauty of a kid at a corner with the, it, it, it looked like sunlight painted, it was yellow paint, putting on this new pair of skates. These are the images I look, looked for. Gatel, who's in the room at Guidance Council, there's three of my colleagues here to, that we, 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 we kicked it, we really did it. And, and we walked over lots, we saw lots of heroin needles and crack files and drug dealing and, 
and alcohol. And we, we really, yes, we saw it all, but we also saw the beauty or we wouldn't have survived. And I didn't want to document those other things because I was not there for a day, a week, a month. This was my life. I belong. When you become a teacher in a school, it's like you're a serf. You belong to that district for a very long time. So it was unconscious, but I was looking for things that were positive or I wouldn't have made it. I am dying to know who this woman is. It's the Studio 54 because she has the T for the New York Times and the M. And she is somebody. She is somebody. Could it be any more Arbus than this? Of course I knew it was Arbus's prints, but here they were right in front of me. Most things were written in a few block radius because that's where I walked. Another opening night. I believe this is Xenon's opening night. And he's a used prints with the glasses. I always thought this young man might grow up to be an executive. I'd love to know what he's doing now. I mean, he's so serious. He's so pre well prepared. He must have been a good student. And there's some other Bushwick people here I know. Another Linda who went to school in the neighborhood. You, you know, she, these are the kids that your, your, your sister taught. The disco scene also went out, like, yes, that's, you know, started going to Fire Island. This is Cherry Grove, the Ice Palace. I bet you she got good tips. <laughs> And then you do you see the scenes, you know, dead and I think it's like dead and alive, the same building. You know, dead and alive. This one got torched, this one didn't. And the reasons are very profound and deep and far stretching why what happened to Bushwick when it did and why it's coming back. Here's a disco scene in a private party in in the Pines, the Star Wars party. And he has a, this is the corner of Myrtle Wyckoff, the subway stop I, I got off. And, and at the time, I remember looking at this woman and thinking she looked just like out of Guys and Dolls. And last year, I was at the same spot, and another person from the Jehovah's Witnesses was at the same spot. They've probably been going back to that same spot for decades. And that's kind of magical to me. Yeah, yeah with all the everything going on and this contrast how lovely to be at Studio 54 I mean we're talking about you know Stonewall was 1969 this is eight years later to be able to be out and dancing in a club that's not hidden away and you didn't think the cops would have come in and beat you up it's just eight years after Stonewall it's, it's kind of miraculous and we were all feeling quite happy and free to be whoever you want to be and here we are in, in Bushwick on, on Palmetto Street. And my gay door was on. These are two gay men on Palmetto Street. And if they weren't gay, then they would be beat up if they talked to anyone the next day. They were just so gay and so out there. Which was really remarkable and tough to do at the time. Yeah. <laughs> Infinity. And yet, I realized, looking back, I look for people doing the same thing, the same actions, the same, po same pose. Her name was Patasa, and she was, I know, she was allegedly hung out with Salvador Dali a lot from, uh, from I believe she's Dominican. Pardon me? Oh, sorry. Ah, welcome to my world. You can't hear me. That's good. Okay. And lying down, stuffed animal on Palmetto. Oh, that sounds much Palmetto Street. That was the block. That Palmetto Street had the highest rate of vacancy in the neighborhood at the time. People, more people were moving out than were moving in, that's for sure. No one was moving in. They were just moving out at rap rapid rates. Studio 54. Those are, yeah, the yellow thing is a popper. And yes, there was lots, of, you know, there were, when the club opened up, there was no liquor license, but there was everything else. There was a punch being served. These guys, I remember go, I was going, we had, I had to go to a meeting at Halsey, which was the school that had the five percenters. It was like known to be a, like a gang. And 
I saw it happening. I, I'm the kind of person I ask permission. I just do. You know, permiso, you know, a little sign, and it, the magic happened, and it was the shake. The person who came to the, to, to the exhibit told me that he committed suicide. I hope that he and he are doing something wonderful. With the boom box in the morning. And going on the steps to a club on the Upper West Side whose name right now, oh, hurrahs. Hurrahs. <laughs> Studio 54, it's a turquoise ring. They're, they're breathing talcum powder. <laughs> and here, watching the witness, this is really not destruction. This is coming up again because people started coming in and taking down what I, with the acres of dead buildings. And it was happening very quickly in the first year I was there. By the spring, the, there were like individuals and small little bulldozers coming in, even sometimes by hand, taking things down. Uh, uh, yes, I always thought this was like Sherlock's shadow at the time. It was like he was Sherlock Holmes, a little boy at the corner. Uh, another opening night, the one, this is the Grace Jones party. I love that the DJs, I mean, it's just. Again, I like to say, I grew up in an area where there, there was n diversity was not a word. But it, it, it was like a, a Chinese family who ran the laundromat. I understand it was someone named Rivera. I didn't even know that was a Hispanic name. To be in New York City was very exciting. To be at a place where di different kinds of people could be friends. And here we are at the corner. Uh, right down the block from the school, under, right, near, near, right near Bushwick High School. Studio 54, 4 a.m. I can't do that anymore. <laughs> and her name was Patou. She was French, and her job was she was a croupier for the, doing blackjack in Atlantic City. A lot of hairdressers, and you know, people with different kinds of jobs who didn't have to be up. It, it's a crack of dawn. We're going out all night. I'm sure you. I'm sure. I get, I'm sure these people can ID these these kids walking down the block doing their like. Um, boy, boy, look. And here we are, Lemouche, and these two guys. Walking, everybody's comparing their muscles. And I would help Judith do her costume. So I don't remember what the theme was that night, but it was two for one. I call this a little, the little rascals of Palmetto Street. If you're familiar with the work of Helen Levitt, of course she was in, she was in my mind, Helen Levitt, because I knew she would have taken the same picture. This is Infinity's bathroom. You're dressed all in white in a place. I mean, come on, look at it. It was a pit. <laughs> And yet, right on there on Knickerbocker Avenue, which was known at the time as the well, you could get any kind of drug you want in the world on Knickerbocker Avenue. Uh, I remember Marisol Rodriguez, and she was just dressed impeccably. Every kid was dressed impeccably. The place, you know, every, every, it was filth disruption, everything around the kids were impeccable. They made fun of me because I didn't wear I, I wore no name jeans or clothes. Like I, they were so stylish and so into just such pride about who they were and how they looked. And here we are at the prom. At one of the clubs, prom night. And you know, it, it's like, gee, how did the styles become changed so quickly, even though they were kind of goofing on other styles. That was just also the style of the hair at the time. I didn't know time went by that quickly. A beauty salon right near, you know, a few blocks, I think it's on Gates Avenue. And when I looked through my little point and shoot, as I saw it happening, I knew, gee, Lewis Hine would have taken this picture. If he walked down this block, he would have taken the same picture. Style. 
my goodness, people have style and they could make it stand up. This was this the black and white party at Le Mouche. And here we have the last wall standing of a building coming down on Gates and Gates and Wilson Avenue. The building on the in the back, this is the first of a series called Hope Gardens. In the site where this rubble is, in this last wall, of course, flash forward in 9-11 when I saw that famous picture, I remembered I took this picture. I, like, I kind of have a photographic memory. I remember what I photograph. I may have not have printed the picture for years later, or even looked at it, and I had to look, but I remember that. People take notes, some people sketch. This is how I embed things in my synapses. And I, I knew I had that image, it had, I had stared at that. And so this, at the time, I was, to help things, I was always applying for grants to, I mean, you got, if you had a budget of $200 a year, that was a lot, it was called Teacher's Choice, and you had to build up your program. So I would apply for grants, I was applying for a green, green thumb program, to do a grant, to do a, a garden at the spot there. And then I found out, like, oh no, you know, this, this, is, pu this is slated for some government project. Well, it ended up being something called Hope Gardens. So it's ironic, it became a garden. And it is the last, last big public housing project done in the country. And it's very successful. It still stands. It was built with people in mind. There are now 12 buildings like this. This is a senior housing project, uh, 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 facility. And it's very thoughtful. And it's work. But you know, you could build a building. Now it's in 82, but it takes decades to build a community. This is a cowgirl at a, at a party, at another Le Clique party. Just exhausted on it. Just, just love her makeup and her muscles. She's just there. And yet, right there along Myrtle Avenue, there's like there was this, you know, these, little, these old fashioned toys, the little horsey toys, and it's just so, so wholesome. And looking at the disco work and in, at the work Bushwick, the Bushwick work is very wholesome. It's like a, they're, they're, they are the real Americana. Okay, sometimes we got rejected from Studio 54 if it wasn't the, the doorman and we knew. But it didn't even matter because it was an opportunity to go to another club. That night, we went to Plato's Retreat. And if you don't know what Plato's Retreat, ask me privately, privately later is. And, and that was uh, quite an experience. And so it was like really went to club after club after club. And then, and then I got a I got a job. I had to get a job. I had needed a full time. I needed a steady job, so I became a teacher. And I had to be not only at work, but conscious and in control of the class at eight o'clock in the morning. Really put to, it really changed my my social life. The, I, boys on Palmetto Street. I mean, they're just such young men, right? They know Michael Jackson. They they live with the, the men in their lives, and they they're terrific. And I want to thank you for for a little preview about the book. <laughs> Please, thank you. So. Would anyone have any questions? Don't of any kind whatsoever. Yes, Jane. I'm bring you a second, sure. Oh, thanks. I was just wondering if you felt at home in in both in the discos and the in the party scene, and also when you started teaching. Did you did you feel at home? That's a very good question. I can say more about the school. Those of us who be stayed in, uh, you know, where we did, it was kind of by choice. You know, y after a while, you know, we could have moved to other schools. I loved teaching in Bushwick. After I got through the pain and I cried for the first few years, I just, I loved the neighborhood. And it made the, 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 the history of the neighborhood my driving force to understand why these gorgeous things were mansions were in rubble and part of my curriculum. I liked it. 
I really enjoyed it. And coming home, and but then I switched schools for, for many reasons later on. Coming back in 2007 to do research for the Brooklyn Historical Society, when I got off the subway, I felt at home. Every time I go back there, I feel very familiar. That's a very nice, yes, it's as home as Hampton Road in Massapequa is, it's, it's home. I, you know, when you work somewhere for 13 or 14 years and you spend most of your time there, it's most of your life. The disco was a, ma a manufactured area. It doesn't exist anymore. It, it, every night was different. At the time, at the time, it was like each night was a different night, and yes, I knew some people, but who, but in, I made lifelong friends in the foxhole. Some of my best friends are my, you know, teachers I've worked with, really some of my great closest friends, <laughs> and some of my long-lasting uh, colleagues, their colleagues. I'm still friends with Judith, but a lot of people, I, I don't see them, they were temporary things, and, and, it, and it t I tired of it. I saw it, you know, waitressing instead and things like that where there was music. I tired of it. Because as Patty would know, I don't identify, e even as a young person, as a youth culture person, believe it or not. Okay. But if I, w well, when I, oh, I didn't hit the disco ball at the club, like when I went, when I started going back to Bushwick and then like hanging. It's like, I've seen this before. I've lived this before. And I really, and it, and it's kind of exciting that, you know, that the music is really popular, and, and you know, it is my generation, it is my music, it was my youth, and I can still dance. Mm -hmm. so, but that's a very good question. Thank you. And going back to particular spots is exciting. But I've gone back to Studio 54 when it was a theater, and I didn't like it, like, ooh, that didn't happen for me. Elaine. They have these photographic projects you took the kids out on. You know, you loved, uh, you really loved the community, you loved the kids, you always loved True. kids, and you wanted to share, you wanted to find out about their vision, and how they felt about their own neighbor community. I don't know if you want to talk about that, but I remember you took the, the, your students out to do... Oh, you went on a lot of trips. And, oh, and yeah. photograph, and you brought them into the city, yeah, uh, yeah. into Manhattan. Yes, we did get uh, something called the Attendance Improvement Dropout Pre Prevention Program, which Linda's sister was... This one, Wait, this is wild. Please tell me, John and Linda, tell us the name of your sister, because... No, no. Oh, you won't? Her sister. No, I don't have Oh, I'm mixing you up with someone. Did you have a sister who worked at the tent? Another person who came, I apologize, okay. ah, who came to my show, her sister was worked in the program with us in, in attendance, in 291, attendance improvement program. I did get like, it came like manna from the heaven, like some, uh, a colleague was said, we're starting an attendance improvement program. You always get to be taking pictures. You want to do a photography program? Sure. And all of, all of a sudden he said, well, here, apply for the job. And here's a manual, like spend like, it was maybe like twelve or fourteen thousand dollars and pick out supplies. It was, it was unbelievable. It was a manna had fallen from the sky, and we had a, a, a fabulous photography program. The students work really ended up not just at the new museum and the DOI Foundation, but at the Whitney Biennial. And it was a project they did photographing what was wrong with our school because it was built without a CFO and they were hanging wires and busted things there and you know, what it would do to change it. And ended up in the Whitney Biennial. That's like a little miracle that that happened. We did some very cool things. Yeah, like this yes. So Vivian Meyer took a lot of pictures that are up close and personal, but a lot of the subjects realized they weren't. You said Vivi did you yeah, say Vivian, Vivian Meyer, yes. yeah, because she had a Roy flex that was yes. like on her mm -hmm. belly. Now it seems like you took it from a higher angle. Did you find very good? Like, yeah, posing. Yeah, too. very good. So. Yes, my I use a true Vivian, and of course when her story come out, I was like totally relate. I mean, because yeah, I have like. Right. I, and we were, there are many photographers in this room, and sometimes you just compulsively take pictures. To, you don't even have time to look at them. It's just what you're doing. Yes, she looked down. I even inherited a, one of those rolly flex from my, my father. It's not my style. I'm a, through the right. lens. I'm yes. I use a single lens reflex. Even my two and a, even my right. two and a quarter is a single lens reflex. My six by seven. I don't like taking pictures through a cell phone. I like what happens when two pupils meet. 
Did you find a lot of resistance when you try to take pictures of people? And what if if so, what do you say to them? Or oh, yeah. I really just, you just said, may I take your picture? Yeah. And if they say no, it's okay. Most times, people say yes because I think I they sense that I'm seeing something in them that's really cool, nice. And if they say no, it's okay. I don't take it personally. It's awesome. No one's ever threatened to kill me or anything because <laughs> I never. I, I, yeah, I just never. Yeah. But that's a very, very good. Yes, my abs, I'm a eye to eye person. Uh, when you first started shooting in Bushwick, was it easy for you to approach people, considering you're not from there, to like shoot them? Well, okay, I started teaching in December, and I got my point and shoot in February. So, and I was walking up and down the block. When you walk up and down the same block every day, you actually see people that recognize you and you recognize them. I mean, you're part of the routine. And actually, some of the kids, were kids are in my school or their little brothers or sisters. You know, it's like... Oh, so the neighborhood already like knew you. She's yeah, like the like that, 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 that's a lady who walked up and down the block. You know, like, okay. you could tell that I was. Uh, <laughs> I look like a. So you were never like worried. I mean, you've always asked the people before you sh shoot them, right? Or ninety-nine percent yes. Uh, would I have gotten the picture of the little boy t looking at the beauty parlor like that if I asked him? No. No. But usually, yes, I asked. Okay. Especially, One more question. Especially like if I thought. Like the guys shaking hands, like they they look like they belong to a, a you know certain certain gangs at the time. I just made sure that I was like. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now in your um disco adventures, yes. What's the most memorable moment that you've had in, during the course of all your partying? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Gee, I never thought about that. Yeah. You know, I I just that you you floored me with that question. No, I don't know. I I I don't have the answer for that. I don't have the answer, but the, I I don't have the answer for that. It was a lot of fun. How's that? It was a lot of fun. There are some some things I'm not prepared to talk about yet. <laughs> But I'm getting there, and there are pictures that might get shown, <laughs> there, but I wasn't ready for it yet. This was scary for me. There, are, I couldn't even put in the book. There are pictures that I couldn't even put the two together because, even though these kids are 40 years old, I can't put it to the opposite of this picture. They're on the next page. No, I, 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 I don't have an answer for that. Don't leave me this way. I guess <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, that's a great question. Any other questions? Hmm. Yes, Hi. John. I don't have a question. But Excuse me, real quick. Like Sorry. I'm gonna have you speak into the mic, please. Thank I'm you. a teacher. I don't really need. No, and he's responsible <laughs> for digging those boxes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I know you always say how much I affected you and how much I I influenced you, and I just like to let you know that after you left. I started doing stuff with the kids where I bought a camera and gave them a camera and told them to go home and take pictures oh, and then we, we put together a magazine about their life and they all, oh, none I of the kids wanted to take the camera. They go, no, no, get busted in my house, man, I can't, I said, just take it. You know what, not one kid stole the camera or broke the camera. I used that same one camera and we did a whole series of magazines. And also to your credit, do you remember those triple dare backdrops? Of course I remember your triple dare. Amazing. 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 We did. We're in the we're in the middle of a place as she says, it looks like Jerez, and she she underplayed the, the terror and the fear and the poverty. This is this was the poorest place in the city, you know, the poorest place in the city. And these kids were amazing, wonderful, beautiful, optimistic kids. I don't know okay, how. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we put together a game show, an actual game show with these kids and she made these incredible backdrops. We called it Triple Dare and she made like a 3D gigantic Triple Dare sign with all the kids. Oh, thank you. It was amazing. <laughs> Just and amazing. you put up the, the show. It was, so it was wild. And she taught them science and they, they won, and you won, you won game shows and you taught, helped, helped each other. And when we were teaching the year before that's when Grandmaster Flash came out. That, that was very significant. That it was all the disco music, and then we started teaching it, and then music changed. And something new came about, and and that was amazing, right? And it's still new music, and it happened there on the streets of those neighborhoods that we taught, we taught in. It's pretty amazing. 
Yeah. We have our last question for the evening right here. I just wondered, um, could you have ever imagined how much New York has changed to the way it is now from back the way it was then? Had you ever imagined I, I, how much? Gee, do I imagine? Well, it was gradual. We saw it happen, right? And I think New York changes because of... Oh my God, I have my ICE family here too. Um, I, oh, oh my goodness, it's, you know, when you're, a, when you're a teacher, and yes, we're so happy to be retired, but there's so many, you work with so many wonderful people who become adults and you see them everywhere you go. It's quite magical. Uh, it was gradual. Yet it was always like, I could never afford to live in New York. You know, it was always like, I was, I'm one of those people, that, thank goodness, we need rent stabilization, right? I live in a affordable housing. You know, the, like for, for, you need to have affordable housing to be able to even keep a teacher in your neighborhood. You need to have good public schools, even if you don't have children. You, um, you, it's been a great, I was am shocked, I live in the Chelsea, right, now? And in the course of the time that we moved back to the Emerald City, my dad's printing place was on 25th between 9th and 10th for decades. And he didn't pass away that long ago, you know, 2002. He would be shocked to see that not only did his building become a luxury co-op, but all the galleries around and the, and the, yeah, yeah, all the, yeah, you know, there's this beautiful pool next to it. It, it was, it's really surprising, that's really surprising. I miss the smell of printing ink inside the buildings. You know, there are certain things I don't want. I'm so glad there is still a, a flower district and there are some things that are very New, New York one of a kind. And I think, I, I, I'd like to know there's a target somewhere, but I don't want it on my corner. You know, I really like the mom and pop feeling of small town New York. Yeah, it's really, it's really important. New York's a very special place. It has its own stamp just for the fact why it's important. You know, like there's a store here that's like a one-of-kind store. It's magical. This is a great place. We don't, let Barnes and Noble mess things up as far as I'm concerned, doing what they did. It used to be a great one-of-a-kind store in New York City, but one across the way. So, yes, but you know, economics changed. I was very, uh, to backtrack, when I came to New York in 75, I was so, so much in my own roaring 20s that I was so glad to be in a place that was so confused as well. I felt at home. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. On behalf of the Strand, thank you, Meryl, so much for being here with us this evening. Thank you all for coming out as well. Um, if you'd like to join us just after this talk, Meryl will be signing books at the table right behind me. Thanks again. Thank you for being my first audio.